Enough of that. David is going to tell us about another of the wonderful Korean K's, K Invisible. After the lecture, there will be time for questions. So let's give David a warm welcome. Please. Thanks very much, Steve. Thank you and thank you everybody for coming. Some friendly faces that I know, and some new faces, some faces that I've seen for the first time. <clears throat> it's nice to see Steve and Mr. Duffy in the spirit of Korea deconstructing, deconstructing my identity and all my work. I, I hear on radio, etc. Um, I'm not. What I'm going to talk to you about tonight is not uh, fully fledged, published academic research or anything like that. I thought I would just talk to you about some ideas that I've been having, uh, ideas based on the conversations that I've been having with, with young people and on what I'm listening to and what's going on in real life, because I think they're very interesting to me. I'm fortunate that I get to uh, interact with a couple of hundred young people uh, every week here in Korea, and it gives me very interesting insight listening to them talking about uh, social issues, political issues, cultural issues. I find it fascinating. And uh, so that's what I'm going to try to go through today. Um, let's see if this works. Point it towards the computer. Right? Uh, put it towards the computer. Okay. Is there a distance on this? Doesn't work. Yeah. Okay, Matt. That's going to be my clicker. Um, for those of you that don't, there's some of the things that I do, but um, as Steve and Michael have said, all of that is rubbish, it doesn't really count for anything. Uh, so let's go to the next one, please. <laughs> Matt. Um, two fantasies about Korea. Two fantasies. One being Helen Joseon and one being Kukbong. Uh, I've been told by some people that I'm not allowed to say Helen Joseon uh, because I'm not Korean. Hello, Joseon is only a term that Korean people are allowed to say. That has been said to me by some people. Um, but both of these visions of Korea I see so prominent across social media. And they're, they're so very easy to understand. Very briefly, Hello, Joseon, um, mocking perhaps in a way the Joseon dynasty, but Hello, Joseon is a place of psychological suffering. It's a place of kaptil and konde and people that say Latin and Maria. It's a place where old people give oppression to the youth, where there's economic inequality, there's a lack of fairness, where the place is just you work, you study, and you die. And that's if you're lucky. And that's the Hel Choson narrative that um, seems to be very not only popular but I think profitable as well. I think that fantasy of Korea has great international and domestic resonance. Alongside of that, you have gukbong. For those of you that don't speak Korean, guk means like nation, and bong is like um, methamphetamine. So gukbong is like this idea. It's used in a comedic way, but it's like Korea number one sparkling. Yes, let's go. Like Korea is the best place in the world. And that image of Korea also exists. One of my favorite stories about kind of gukbong uh, fantasy is that if I show my students like the soft power rankings of, around the world, there's many different soft power rankings. Korea normally comes in at about number 10. You have countries like Japan, Switzerland, and Germany producing Sony, Nintendo, comes in at around number 10. And then some of my students will start raising their hand. Why aren't we number one? Like, Korea should be number one in this Hukong fantasy. So these two, these two fantasies about Korea both exist. And I want to try to unpack them a little bit. Uh, Matt, if I can, please. Now, I won't say too much on theory. Like, as an academic, you're meant to have theories and uh, it's meant to be things like this. But let me just give you one idea here, which is from Slavoj Žižek. 
uh, which I found very interesting recently. And this is the parallax theory. And draw your attention to this. And in this, Korea is the object. And viewpoint A might be Hell Joseon, and viewpoint B uh, might be the book on heaven. Now, people are both looking at Korea because they come from different backgrounds, different perspectives. They see Korea fundamentally differently. Now, they're both correct in their looking at Korea, and what they see is a, a, a part of Korea that's true. I use the word fantasy, but some of it is true. But can they both be true at the same time? For example, when you see the middle picture, is that a vase, vase, or two faces? Some people see the vase. Like some people see the two faces. And you can kind of switch your brain, but you can't see them both at the same time. You either see the vase or the two faces. You either see Hu Joseon or Gukbong Korea. And which one you see kind of depends on well, I'll go into this, but it kind of depends on who you are. Um, on the very far right, we have Holbein's 1533, over 500 years, about 500 years old, this picture of the ambassadors. And what you might notice is this skull here. This is a skull. How he did this in 1533 blows my mind. Um, this is a skull here, but you can't quite see it. You can't quite make it out. And I'm wondering if it's just easy to talk like this. But it sounds like Can you hear my voice? Yes. No, Steve said no. Okay. <laughs> He's actually sat right in front of the speaker when he said that as well. So, <laughs> uh, that's, that's so I can hear. Yes, okay. The only way to see the skull is not to look at it. If you look at the skull like you look at any other normal object, you won't see it. But to see it, you have to not see it. To see it, you have to do something that you don't normally do. Weird, but what we're getting into is how much do we perceive of reality and, and how much do we not? Matt, you can ask me to think through, please. Now, let's talk about Helen Jocelyn a little bit. Now, with Helen Jocelyn, some of the things that often come up um, is that Korea doesn't have. Korea doesn't have great gender equality. Uh, Korea doesn't have working hours. And when this comes up, it's always comparing Korea to Western standards. And people will say, oh, look, at, look at Sweden. We compare Korea to France. We compare Korea to Canada. And we put Korea next to an international, often a Western state. And we say, why isn't Korea the same as that? And I'm not sure that that's really a fair test. And I'll try to show you on the next one, but it's as if the Western standard must be right. And this attitude takes no account of Korea's trajectory, no account of Korea's history, no account of Korea's culture. It's just why isn't Korea like that? I find a lot of my international students, especially those from Western Europe, Northern Europe, Scandinavia, they come and they're just like, this is not like where I'm from. And it, it just blows their mind. And they say, they see Korea as they want it to be, not as it is. And Korea never meets up to those utopian standards. Korea never meets up. Ah, yeah. There was this fantastic statistic that I read on the radio in which I was appearing. Uh, the height that the most the happiest countries in the world are often put as uh, Denmark, Iceland, Finland, the Scandinavian countries. Yeah, absolutely, they're the happiest. And Korea is a, uh, a terrible landscape of unhappiness and solitude. The happiest countries in the world also have, at the same time, the highest consumption of antidepressants. So Denmark, Finland, and Iceland in the top 10, their numbers like one, three, and seven of antidepressant, antidepressant consumption. That amazed me, because then it's like, well, are you happy or are you high? You know, <laughs> Did, did, did you answer that question before you took pills or after? Not that taking pills is good or bad, but we see Korea as hell because it's not like the West. It's like, ah, it's not, it's not quite right. And uh, sorry, Judy, I'm from China. Let it go. Um, Korea is never quite perfection. It's not good enough, this view. This view of Korea, it's, it, it's not quite good enough. And it has little understanding of history, I think, because 
while career is not perfect, I, I think sometimes it's pretty good. Matt, when you get a minute, let's go to the next slide and then let's bring um, some BTS in, or let's bring two tweets in. Um, I, I like this one that I saw online the other day. Um, don't believe everything you see in K dramas. All the terrible things in them are actually true, but most of the good stuff in them is made up. Right? And that's a very popular view online by a person with a lot of influence in Swaya. And they're, they're telling the international world all of the stuff that you see in the dramas, all of the bad stuff is true. All of the good stuff, nonsense. Very popular view abroad. Why I think this is interesting is because we here, and I'm talking to the wrong people because we live in Korea and we know that a lot of people only engage in Korea through social media, through tweets, through dramas and things like this. RN, uh, rap monster, I get trouble for saying that. RN, the leader of BTS, he was doing an interview with a Spanish magazine and they said to him, your country is really unhappy, isn't it? Like your country, the suicide rates and things like that. And he, he, he turned back to them and he said, you do realize that we were colonized. You do realize that your countries were going around the world colonizing people and we were suffering that colonization. And you do realize that our country was rubble and we had to build everything from that rubble into what it is today. And we did it in a very short period of time. It was war, remember a few years. What did he say? Um, well, there you go, you can see it on there. And then he says, the West wants Korea to calm down, stop putting so much pressure on yourself. Don't do that. Stop succeeding. Stop getting things right. Slow down. We forget how other countries built themselves. They didn't build themselves beautifully. The United Kingdom, when it went through the Industrial Revolution, when it had Dickensian sweatshops. The, the, the United States with slave labor. These countries didn't build themselves beautifully with everybody singing Kumbaya together. And, and, and so Korea now with the international spotlight on it is meant to do everything nice and clean. And it's almost like, well, we did it, but you're not allowed to do it anymore. Korea has done it against all the odds. There is sometimes this idea that, you know, it, all countries will become democratic if they try this spooky army of belief, but it's not what Korea has achieved is incredible because you only need to look north of the border. And sometimes I say, well, North Korea has achieved is incredible because it's rebuilt its city and it's built nuclear bombs despite the whole world not doing it. Like, fair play, <laughs> what well, you've done. Um, even if I much prefer living in this Korea, he says, there's always going to be a shadow if you do something this fast. You expect us to build this city. Expect us to do all this and not make some mistakes or not get some things right. And why does the hell just on, you know, why do we always look at the bad things? Matt, can we go to the next one, please? Um, the good one. <clears throat> now, I find the good one one, and I have to be really careful how I do this because I get students that come from all over the world. What I find, not every case, is chintsa sabasa. And sabasa means it differs from person to person. And sabasa, hajiman, ilban dokoro, in general. I find the, the gukwon view, the, the, the idea that if you come to Korea, <laughs> one view of Korea is that everybody has mental health problems and they want to kill themselves. And we know that's not true, but it's a narrative online. Another view is that if you come to Korea and walk down the streets, everybody is going to be like a motti no ma, right? Everybody's going to look like they're from a K-pop music video. That's clearly not true. That view, sometimes this, this idea that Korea is a fantasy where, where everybody looks like these people. Last year, um, I, I asked some of my students to give their closing thoughts on a contemporary Korean studies course and the German student I told this story once and then he, he sent me a message. He said, I, did you, I heard you talking about my story. <laughs> so if he gives this again, Bernardo, thank you. Uh, the German student, Bernardo is a big man for German, it's true. Um, Bernardo said to me, uh, and I'm going to do a bad German accent because I've got a mic, why not? Uh, Bernardo said, I like Korea, it's very nice. Yes, it's good, it's clean. 
but the roads, they don't follow the rules. They're bad drivers. If bad, they must drive nicely. They don't follow the rules. He was very angry. He was banging the desk. And the next person to speak was a young woman from Indonesia. And she was wearing uh, a hadith. She's a, a young Muslim lady. She was really dressed. And she looked at it and she went, the roads here are lovely. Everyone drives really nice. It's so safe. In Indonesia, I think I'm going to die every time I cross the road. And, and both of those views exist. Right? The German guy came here and he was like, Gee, these guys can't drive. You got you need the autobahn. And then the young woman from Indonesia was like, oh, this place is amazing. Look at the highways, look at the expressways, it's safe. Yeah. So sometimes our view of Korea, um, it tells us more about who we are than what Korea is. So you know, if, if you see Korea as a, as a, as a hellscape for gender, it tells me that gender is really important to you. If you see career as an economic career, money is important to you. It's sometimes telling me more about you than it is about career. That's not a bad thing. I, I, I want to learn about you. But the, the heaven standard, we always talk about how you and career in terms of Western success. Korea is so big in Southeast Asia. Nobody really acknowledges it enough, especially not Korea. Like how much the people from the Philippines and Malaysia, and Indonesia, they love they, they love this. It's so huge there. And we just don't kind of pay attention to it. Um, Matt, this is some recent data. Uh, it's not data, but it's this idea that I found fascinating is that um, K-pop consumers, like people that get into this version of, of Korea, they're often people that are excluded from their own communities. It's kind of interesting to me. This is from some recent academic research. But the people that you find really into K-pop, they might not always be the majority in their own country. They might not always be the cool kids where they're from. They might be excluded ethnically. They might be excluded in terms of sexual orientation. They might just be excluded on any number of things, but then they find community in, in those K-pop groups. And so K-pop and, and how you do it becomes for them uh, like a sanctuary, like a church, like a thing that they can find a level for. Uh, Matt, if we can, please, let's see where we go. So what I've tried to give you here, and I'll just lay on this, is that phenomenology, say that after a few beers tonight, <laughs> phenomenology. Um, the, when we all look at Korea, we access Korea through our consciousness. We're conscious thinking, feeling beings. Korea is not ones and zeros and binary data. Korea is something that we experience consciously. And my conscious is different from your conscious. That's a great thing. My conscious is different from Mr. Duffy's conscious and all of your consciousnesses. And so the Korea that we're getting is never the same. We're always getting a different career because of the way we interact with the world. Um, Matt, maybe the glory is coming up next. Yes, okay. Um, I'm not sure how many people have seen the glory. Uh, I won't be giving too many spoilers, but you know, let's try to talk about these kind of things. I everybody was telling me to watch the glory, and I watched the first 20 minutes of it, like took a month ago. I watched the first 20 minutes, I just turned it off. I was like, this is mental trauma, this is disgusting. I just couldn't watch it. Like, it's making me feel bad. People said, well, David, like, watch it. And so I watched it. Now, I think in the glory, you get Hel Joseon and Gukpong, Gukpong Heaven playing out exactly. Two fantasies. I'm not sure if you get much of reality in the glory. Um, with these characters, I don't even you hear that word. I learned so many swear words watching this, this drama. Like, it really, that in Casino, Kachiyo, we were Chemichik. I like that one because he had a big belly. Like it was nice to watch a K-drama with an adjoshi with a big beer belly and things like that. I think my costume tonight is a little bit monotony. Um, these are the bad characters, and these are the perfect characters. Go to the next slide, please. Matt, and I'll see if I can break it out. Okay. I'm not sure if my career is correct, but I tried to write it as best as I could. These characters, sexual leso, nafiko. They're bad because they have sex, and they have sex because they're bad. These characters. So 
it's a good job you read that disclaimer when we get to hear Steve about the content of the RAS. And these, these, they don't have sex because they're the good guys. And they're the good guys because they don't have sex. Right? I, I find this fascinating that these characters, they were just all sort of sleeping with each other indiscriminately. And there were these very intense sex scenes that I wasn't quite used to in K-dramas. Like sitting there watching, I was like, wow, you get a full frontal shot of breasts in there. Right? Imagine seeing that tits on the telly. Um, but you only see them from the bad characters. Because good characters don't do that. Good characters don't have sex. Because they're good. Good characters, they live together, they cook each other food, they have nice conversations, they're beautiful, but they're not horny. <laughs> One of my favorite sentences is, everybody's beautiful, but nobody's horny, right? It sums them up. They might once occasionally sort of brush against each other, right? But this is, this, this is fantasy. And it really amazed me that the glory is presenting now, like, there's sex and these contents, but it's only in this way. And it's either, if you have sex, you are going to hell and all of this, and if you don't, you're going to heaven. We go to the next one, please, Let's see what else I've got. Before I do that, I just want to talk about drugs as well, because there's the word drugs. Um, in the glory, there's a character called Sarah, who, who does a lot of drugs. She's bad because she does drugs, and she does drugs because she's bad. And uh, it's generally like kind of cannabis, but the symptoms and the effects seem to be like heroin or something. She's constantly scratching, she's throwing around on the floor. I, I, I love that in Korea you could go to any Noribang, and they'll be playing the Beatles, Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin. They love the effects of what drugs have made, but not the idea that I'm waiting to see a character in like a K drama where you can just be morally ambiguous and have sex. I'm not sure we'll see that yet. Now, let's get here. In the past, some of you, I hope, remember this drama, Winter Sonata. It's going back. In the past, back what, 20 years ago, something like that, Korea wasn't always a good place. One of the first stories that I remember is coming here, and I was teaching this uh, wonderful woman from AIG Insurance, and during our break time, we would go down into Kwamun and we would smoke cigarettes together. She said to me, David, if anyone comes up to me, just pretend I'm Japanese. Because I thought she would still slap her if she was smoking in the streets. Right? It, was, it was kind of like that. I, I spoke to my wife, who's recently gone back to work. She's now working in Gangnam. And I, I, I said to her, like, what's the subway like these days? She took seven, eight years off uh, to raise our two children, which I uh, doffed my cap to her uh, so much. She's like, the subways are so much safer now than when I was young, David. Right now, the subways, all the men have got their phones in their hand, and they're really careful where they put their hands, and they, and they don't want to touch. And she feels it's different. She feels it's safer. It's not perfect. But Korea today is safer for women. Not absolutely safe, but it's safer for women than it was. There's less racism today in Korea than there was. There's less poverty than there was. Right? In the past, Korea wasn't hell, but Korea wasn't that good. And when you look at the dramas of that time, the dramas were showing the other, the dramas were showing this beautiful relationship. So what I'm trying to get at you is that in the past, life was hard. Many of you will know that life was different. Okay? We sometimes romanticize that, oh yeah, it's great in the 70s and 80s, military you know, dictatorships. Um, it was this, but the, the dramas showed the opposite. The dramas showed the release. The dramas showed you what was possible. Now, Matt, if we go to the next one, please. All the dramas are about hell. Hellbound, Squid Game, Kizem Tim, Tiu Hak, We Are All Dead, The Glory, DP. Man, they love these hell dramas these days. They love this death. They love this. And 
the reality, well, reality heaven, I put that in, like, because let's not pretend that career is heaven. But you can have pride in front of City Hall. That's, that it's, it's, not, it's not San Francisco, I know. But you can have that. You can have vlogs about this. There's more civilizing behavior. There's less violence in society these days. There's less abuse. The society's got better. And so what I see is that a lot of people will look at these dramas and go, oh my God, like Korea, that place sucks, man. You're just dying. And I'm like, no, Korea's not bad, man. It's getting better. It's getting better. It's, it's certainly not perfect. I and mean, there's a lot of economic problems. There's a middle class that needs some help. But how did these two work out? Let's keep going, Matt, so we can get through this. When the, when the unfortunately named DP came out, what I want to point out about DP, which was a drama that showed the, uh, the violence that takes place in the military, the psychological abuse, which is, I've had young men in my class stand up and say, I want you to thank me for doing my military service. Because military service is about isolation, deprivation, and hardship. It's not nice. It's not some hotel. And um, when this came out in 2021, it was showing the problems of the military from seven years prior. It was showing the problems after the society had cleaned it up. How did the society clean up? Well, there were mobile phones introduced so people could record. There were different, um, there were different legislations put forward. The sergeants, the generals knew they had to be on better behavior because their, their behavior would be spread over the internet. And if your behavior is spread over the internet in Korea, you're in trouble because the internet is a dangerous place. Man. Akpul, those kind of things, they'll come and get you really well. And so what I want to point out about this is, it showed the horrors after the horrors had finished, after the horrors had finished, but again, the horrors are still there, but it didn't show it during. Matt, can you go to the next one, please? So as society gets better, the dramas get worse. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. As, as South Korea, when I say civilized, I, I don't mean in some kind of Rudyard Kipling white man's burden, that's the wrong thing. What I mean is now that you're less likely to have people screaming and hollering on intercity buses and subways and things like that. Because if you do that now, CCTV, they'll catch you. As society is getting better, the dramas are getting worse. Why is that? Why are the dramas getting worse? Well, one of the reasons that we might say the dramas are getting worse is because, right? This Germany. Because you can show those dramas in South Korea. You can show the glory, the glory in South Korea. You can show the in South Korea, parasite. Why? Because South Korea is an open society. South Korea is a democratic society. You wouldn't be able to show them on the Park Hong especially during the, the, the Yushin Revolution and things like that. You wouldn't. North Korea has many depictions about on North Korea. It doesn't have Hel Pyongyang. Hel Pyongyang would be a great one too. I think I just said that for the first time, Hel Pyongyang, right? Um, TM, maybe. You can use it, make something with it. But in North Korea, you can't do these depictions of dystopia. Maybe if Jack was listening, he'll tell me about some of the webtoons or, or comics that they make. But in general, I would say the counterintuitively, counterintuitively, the dramas that show the negative aspects of South Korea actually point to the positives. And so if you see the, the negatives, you're like, ah, oh, yeah, but you don't, you miss the point that South Korea can make those now comfortably. And people are not going to shut them down as long as we don't have our command blacklists or things like that. But um, North Korea can't make those things. Let's continue, please, Matt. Now, 
do these negative depictions of Korea make the West feel better about themselves? Something that I read a lot. Ah, yeah, that must be because they're sad. Korean people must be because they're lonely. That's it. They're not individual like us. They don't do things right. And so subconsciously, the, the depictions of Korea that seem to resonate, like when you read The Guardian, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, you don't read about hometown cha-cha-cha. You don't read about, I like hometown cha-cha-cha because she did not, I'm a big fan of she did um, I like her and she up stuff as well. But the, the relatively mundane, I, I'll, I'll also bring up my community, uh, my liberation lows, didn't make any waves internationally. The ones that make waves internationally are the ones that show Korean people dying. There's nothing more profitable these days than dead Koreans, suffering Koreans, stressed Koreans, painful Koreans. If you put that into it, it's not my personal desire or choice, but if you put that into a drama, you're going to make bank. You're going to get it. Why? Why? And I'll stop and I'll make sure there's time for questions, but why do those predictions still work so well? Is it because it makes the West feel better about themselves? You know, it's like, well, we may have uh, mass shootings all the time and conservative governments and things like this, but at least it's not like that. That's all. Matt, can we go to the next one, please? <coughs> It sells so well, you know, this idea makes so much money. The capital of anxiety, the the of right? The, the, the making money of suffering and pain of these depictions. And I'm not sure why. Um, but I know that they're the ones that resonate most. They're the ones that resonate most. And what happens is, I get this with North Korea, when I teach my students about North Korea in the lectures, and I show them pictures of water parks and people in the street and things like that, and they look at me and they're like, hey, North Korea doesn't have water parks. And I'm like, yeah, they do. <laughs> Why not be a water park you want to go to? But they do, they have water parks and theme parks and have department stores and things like this. Because all they see of North Korea is missiles and guns and people goose-stepping across Kim Il-sung Square. And so, my North American students are like sometimes scared of North Korea. Like, oh my God, North Korea. <laughs> and that's because of the media that they consume. The media that they consume about North Korea. But this is about South Korea, and the media that people consume about South Korea is either Hell Joseon or Wong Hill. And the head just someone seems to have so much financial weight. And when you watch, when I, when I speak to some people about, you know, if I speak to some people about Kwang Chun, they'll tell me about Park Yun Jong Sa. If I speak to some people about Lee Sun Sin, they'll tell me about the movie, which I mean, the movies and the dramas come to mind quicker than history for young people these days. And so when they're accessing Korea, they, they're like this. This is what they think of, these kind of scenes. Uh, Matt, please. It's, um, I, I, I think social media uh, plays a big role in this. I, I've told this story before, but I once asked a popular, not sure how, I, I once asked a popular uh, person, like, why do you only post negative stories about Korea? Why, why, why don't you go something nice? They said to me, because the nice stories don't get any attention. Post something nice about Korea, social media won't respond to it. Post some horror story, blah, 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 click, 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 like, 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 retweet, retweet, retweet. But, but that's not necessarily their fault, I don't think. That's, you know, they might have a living as, a, as an influencer, as a social media person, and they're used to those dopamine hits of likes and things like that. I know it's real because I have to struggle it with myself. I'm trying to stay away from social media a little bit, but there's so much more engagement for negative stories across social media as well. 
And I, so I don't just think it's media companies. I, I think it's all of us. I would love with my students, and like, especially international students, go out and take a picture of Korea. And they'll come back with one or two pictures. And one will be beautiful, and cherry blossoms, all of this. The other one will be an old person pushing cardboard down the street. It's one or the other. It's never just like this, <laughs> you know. This is this is the real kind of career to me. But let, let's keep going with that. So the gamification of society. Modern modern society is secularized. There's no dragons anymore. There's no myths. There's no Tokgebis. Not that Tokgebi, that's on you. But there's no Mante Halabodi. There's no spirits anymore. And when we have problems, the news gives us rational analysis of statistics. And President Newton is going to try to solve the birth rate, all of these things. And it's rational analysis and statistics and data and numbers and, and figures. And it's never a story. It's never something with a spirit. It's never a narrative. And as people, we're moved by narratives. We're moved by the dramas. People will watch Kim Ji-yeun, Kai si ki and say, oh, that's what you know. Right? Why am I French? I wasn't French, but you get the idea. You see the statistics and, and they won't do much. You give them a story, you give them a book, and it will move. And society has become secular. And those fantasies and the heaven and the hell, they speak, I think, somewhere to us. But we want stories and we want bad guys and good guys. We don't want data. Data is boring. Uh, but, so if South Korea is not heaven, if South Korea is not hell, what is it? I'm not going to tell you what it is. That's very important because if I did, I would be undermining my own point. I also drink from the trash can of ideology. Right? The way I see Korea is based on my own perspectives. <clears throat> so please don't think that I'm giving you the truth. I'm not giving you the real truth between heaven and hell. I'm just giving you a different Fantasy, my fantasy. Um, I, the true miracle is not the miraculous, it's the mundane. It is in the mundane every day that we see a sublime. When you see thousands, ten thousands of people take the subway every day and commute in and out, Without chaos, without horror, without suicide happening everywhere. That's the miracle. That's the miracle that he does that. Without policemen chasing people upstairs and taunt on them, get the bike easy. That's the miracle. The miracle is when nothing happens. And South Korea is a country in which nothing happens a lot of the time. And that nothing happening is good. But we don't really hear about nothing happening. And, and I must I must say this is with no disrespect to those that suffer or those that do face hardships because they are real and they, and they do deserve to be acknowledged. But what I'm trying to say is that the, the miracle, like the skull in the ambassadors, right? Remember that skull? To see it, you have to not see it. If you want to see the miracle of South Korea, you have to not look at the dramas on social media and the head of the South Korea is awesome, South Korea is terrible. It's uh, when you stop looking, then you see the miracle of South Korea, which is this, which is that, um, which is you, I suggest. So the miracle is in the mundane. Uh, Matt, please. I, I, I liked a little bit of this drama. I, I must confess that I. I don't watch all the dramas, but I have to because this is what I teach and I like to be aware of what's happening. This is my Hebangilji, which translates to my liberation notes. It's very popular among people around me in their 30s and 40s. Kind of a silent majority of people that don't come onto Twitter all the time. They would come to me and tell me they come watch this drama. It's good. What happens in this drama is it's whatever. They kind of commute back and forth every day in a quiet monotony. And they stare out the window and they drink because they're bored. And they just get through life and they struggle and their love lives are not brilliant. 
and they want things and they desire things and they don't quite get them. And it's ultimately unremarkable. And that's why I thought that one was that one was good. That one was saying something. And that one was the invisible. I wrote the title K Invisible before I even knew what it meant. <laughs> I just had it I'm like, oh, that sounds good. Uh, K Invisible. So I started with the title and worked backwards. And when I finally got here, I was like, oh, okay, maybe it was meant to be like that. But the, the invisible is that which we don't see on social media. And, then, and that's the miraculous one. That might be the last slide. I'm not sure. Is there one more? Oh. Um, this might work as a video, I'm not sure, but before I try to play this, um, during this talk, I made suggestions that Korean society is getting better, that Korean society is improving, and there might be some that would say to me, yeah, David, that's because you're a white man, and society is safe for you, and, and you feel like that, and that's true, and I acknowledge that, but my uh, experience of something will be very different from other and so when I was speaking to this young woman here, her name is Joy um, I, you know, she's, she's very outspoken about gender issues and things like that. And uh, I asked her about it. Like, What's your take, Yanti? That's what I do in my work, by the way. I try to listen to Korean people. Okay. It took me about five years to realize that I shouldn't try to tell Korea what to do but just to listen. And uh, that's what I've been doing with this project. Matt, this might play. I'm not sure if we've got sound on, but if you go, there you go. <clears throat> that's a good question about sound. So for those that put it in, sorry about the quality, but um, Tanji is saying that she said in her own words, no one's going to steal from you. There are thieves, there are kanpe, there are tebi, there are kokdems, there are different people in Korean society. But probably you might notice that you can go to a coffee shop and leave your phone and your laptop and go to the toilet and come back and it will be there. Yeah, that's, that's how I live and that's what I do. And that's what Kanji is saying. That's, that's real. Do you know how hard it is to create a society like that? I think one day we can realize, oh wow, we had it so good. I would not do that in a pub in England. I would not do that in a coffee shop in England. Leave my phone there. Yeah. No way. But you can do it here. It's not a very exciting story. It's the invisible story. It's the story that we all live. And he also said, she's not really scared of walking anywhere at night. So you know, she'd go out and she'll she walk. There's no, these are her words, I can't speak for her, but and I, I think one day we might look back at this and go, oh, wow, we actually did have it pretty good. There's no places in this city where it's like, you shouldn't go there. And she said, well, even if somebody does want to do something immoral, they'll catch you. You won't just disappear into the ether. And yeah, that's, that's the career that I think is interesting. That's the career that I wanted to talk about. That's the career that we don't see. I think that, that might be it if, if we go there. Um, so tell me what I got wrong. I mean, we've got loads of people in here. This is great. Tell me what I got wrong. Tell me what I missed. Tell me like why I'm full of the S. Tell me what happens next. Tell me, tell me your thoughts and uh, thank you for listening to this poor tuning chick look like one of me. Thank you. Uh, David, I'm going to let you field your own questions. Uh, there's no reason for me to immediate that. And uh, Matt, if people, uh, if you folks that are online, if you want to type in the chat box, Matt can help us field your questions as well. We'll do as many as we can. 
in the time that's available. So, uh, David, go ahead and uh, just a few questions. By the way, you're really wrong about. <laughs> Oh, sir. Thank you. Oh, we didn't pick that up, did we? Yeah, that might be the reason. Thank you for your big time. Honestly, you know, your letter is extraordinarily sophisticated for me to understand my time. Well, no, I like to go to Jack in Slovenia. Yes. Is a check with check Slovenia? Yes. When you you just made mentioned the Jesus Powers view on theory. Yes. Why don't you specifically bring to the story of the statement? Can you explain the opinion? I could understand. Yeah, okay. Okay. Say. Thank you very much for the question. Um, uh, sorry, can I ask you to go back to the if it's still there? Um, if not, don't worry. Uh, it's here. Yeah. 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 I have never heard about that. That's good. Um, there's a slide right near the beginning of the map. Ambassadors. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for your attention. Yeah. That one. Yes. Now, one of the ways, now, Slam would use a complaint for a thousand pages to explain this in his book. So if I can't explain it, just now, please forgive me. The Zizek is a terribly hard man to read and understand. Right. Let me give you one example. If you're in a car mm -hmm. and you're driving, and you're in a car and you see the window going past you, yeah. and you look out the window, yeah. and the trees are moving past you really fast. Right. The trees. Uh -huh. but the building back there just kind of stays in your vision for a long time. Uh -huh. So, the nature of something depends where we look at it from. Yeah. They're both correct. But when you look at Korea, sometimes it tells us not about Korea itself, it tells us about where you're coming from. Now, the historian E.H. Khan had something like this. He said that um, the the historian study will tell you more about what the historian is interested in than their area of expertise. So, for example, just for example, so if you write a book about Korea shipbuilding industry, I know you're interested in shipbuilding. But the perspectives and uh, our conclusions are derived from where we look at it from. And so there's no, it's kind of the postmodern, it's saying there's no, is there a Korea? What is Korea? Korea is conservative, Korea is progressive, Korea is modern, Korea is traditional, Korea is religious, Korea is secular, Korea is awesome, Korea is terrible. They're all true and they're not true. And then you're like, can we get to what Korea is or is it just like eating spoon with a fork? Always a sentence. So a parallel series is it, supposed to be subjectivism. Could go deeper than that, goes into Lacan and psychoanalysis. Does that help? Doesn't. No. I'll I'll drop some value. I'll put some more shit for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. There was a question up on the screen here. Uh, this uh, this question um. Address the easing of television broadcast censorship and how that has affected the rise of talented Korean film directors that unfortunately still mostly male in opening up the expense of filmic expression freedom. In my opinion, that is that's quite a realistic topic beyond the predictor of war. Zachary, I can fancy films, thank you. Um, well, the television censorship and the Korean film, they might be a little bit different, but uh, I mean, if you talk about Park Tanok, uh, these directors, they grew up under uh, dictatorship. And so they express these. I, I think the film industry has always been ahead of its time. Somebody said that Gloria was new because it was depicting revenge and this was pointing to something in Korean society. But Park Chan you know, Revenge Trilogy and Old Boy, that was 20 years ago and it's there. Um, what I see with the dramas, I know you're asking about the, the film directors are mostly male, but the dramas 
Um, the same woman, I, I believe her name is Kim and Suk, I'm not wrong. Uh, she wrote Mr. Sunshine, Tokebi, uh, The Glory. There's a lot of female writers uh, appearing in dramas, and the drama industry is being driven by women writers. And maybe their identity tells us about the story. Their, their suffering and what they've gone through, and that's why they're depicting those things. Maybe uh, one of Lacan's ideas that Shijek really likes is that you access reality through fantasy. That's why fantasy is important. You access reality through fantasy. So maybe by looking at these dramas, we can understand the lives of Korean women in how they tell these stories. So um, I'm not sure if that answers Julie, Julie's question, but that was my best effort at it. I would point to the women creating these dramas. Anyone in here? Yes, please. Hi. It's not so much a question, but an observation regarding um, society improving, going to heaven, and uh, then drama going to hell. Mm. Um, possibly it's simply catharsis. If everyday life becomes more monotone or more shaped, like going to work, cleaning the house, finding a mate, going to work and starting all over. There's possibly not so much excitement and there's still the hunger and the need for excitement, for passion, for the unspeakable. And so it just might be logical that those dramas become more extreme. That's just too boring to watch the boring even on Netflix. And besides that, I live in Berlin. And I love it, especially during summertime here in Korea and the pedestrian walkways, that there's shades protecting from the heat. And every time I see that, every time I'm sheltered by the shade, I'm so grateful because in Berlin, these shades, they would be stolen, they would be damaged, they would never exist. The society in Berlin, possibly Germany in total, would not allow for such a thing. So I think it's fantastic that this is happening in today's times in a modern country. I think it's wonderful. I would be so blessed if the old world, if Europe, Germany, if we could learn from that. Thank you, yeah. And also, before you turn your microphone off, if I may, the, the heated ones in winter as well. They have heated ones in winter. I haven't been in Korea in winter. I will return. It gets cold and they have something to warm your bum up. So let me ask you one question. How do they do it? How does it work? How do you create a society where your wallet is safe and you're free from the shade and people aren't stealing it? And they have unmanned penny jumps. They have convenience stores with nobody in and people don't go in there and steal stuff. Exactly. How does that work? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I was also Tom Tuggle with my dad, I'm person, but yes, there is CCTV, thank you. But my question was, though, how does that happen? Because if we knew how it happened, we could instill it in other countries, just like, uh, it might be Uri. Uri. We don't have Uri in Germany. We're in Namjian. That's weird, isn't it? <laughs> Our husband. I walk down the street with my kids, and some ladies will come up and go, oh, Uri's yeah, one of my said they're my kids, I pay for them. <laughs> they're expensive. And let me just address this question of if I may of catharsis, because I think catharsis is very interesting. And the idea of catharsis, a lot of South Korean things point to economic inequality. So parasites, squid games, things like this. And what I find interesting about catharsis is that we will watch this and we'll go, yeah. And then we'll go to Starbucks and consume with impunity because we just watched something about economic equality. So the most successful products in capitalism are products that rally against capitalism, which is fascinating to me. And then it actually will prolong 
the capitalism, uh, I'm not saying capitalism is good or bad, but we'll all watch it. And instead of going out and doing something about it, we just watch the movie. And then it is doing it for us. It's acting out our catharsis. I came up with this sentence. I typed it into my cacao on the way like yesterday. I don't know if it makes sense. Check, check this out. When you see oppression and you feel a lump in your throat, that's empathy. I'm not going to start singing that's more, I don't worry. When you work hard to solve problems of oppression for other people, that's love. Okay. I'm not sure that answered your question, but I just want to give you that. Uh, Tom has been raising his hand. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, that, uh, your question about why you can leave your smartphone or your laptop. Pop on a desk and go to the bathroom, go the full time, and it will be there. Uh, it's not totally unique to Korea. Uh, for example, my first engagement with Asia was in the early 70s in Japan. And at that time, you could see that saying you could leave almost anything and no one would lift it. At the same time, when I came to Korea, in 1975, you did not dare do that. It would be gone as soon as you turn the other direction. Now, what has happened, of course, is Korea has economically and politically, and you could even say spiritually, developed considerably since that time. So that both Japan, Korea, and I guess you could have places like Singapore, there's a strong sense of, it may not be true, but a mythology that everyone is more or less equal economically. And there is a strong sense of a shame of being caught, not only of yourself, but of your family. Now, in Korea, in the early uh, mid-70s, there was not so much shame because there was a, obviously so much of disparity that everyone was struggling so hard ethically and unethically to make ends meet and perhaps get ahead. That is not so much the case uh, in the current mythology. That everyone feels like they're kind of more or less struggling together. And this is a strong aspect of a lot of Asian societies, to a lesser degree I've seen in Thailand. But it's not quite there yet because there's still a much more blatant economic disparity in Thailand than in Korea and Japan and Singapore. So I think there's a lot to do with Asian cultures that has nothing to do with Europe or North America so much. Yes, there are questions up there too. Um, Two questions. I'm wondering if you could explain more about why the popularity of Hallyu is ignored within Southeast Asia. Um, I can only speculate. Uh, thank you for the question, Bill. Um, sometimes I would see the you know rose or rose for black pink. She she would be number one in Indonesia for four weeks, and nobody would know about it. And she'd get number sixty-eight on the British charts, and there would be an article about it. And so success in certain countries is valued differently. It's like, does Korea need a Grammy or an Oscar to be to be valued for its, you know, to, to, for recognition? Shouldn't do. Japan generally doesn't care about those things. Like Japan is like, no, we don't, we don't really care if you like it or not. We like it for ourselves. Yeah. I, I think Korea still, for the, I went to the, Asia Campus University of Utah up in Songbo to give a lecture there. And then all these people from America came over, and one young lady, she asked me about how do Korean names work? I was like, okay, um, name a famous Korean person for me, somebody that you know. She didn't understand how the names worked at all. And I said, well, name a Korean person for me. And she went, I don't know any Korean people. And I went, oh, well, okay. So you might have somebody like that. And she went, oh, no, no, I got one. I said, who? She went, Kim Jong un. What she said, my word of a lie. And I think for the longest time, South Korea was in this battle for legitimacy. It wanted to be known, it wanted to be recognized, but it was always international media would focus on the other Korea, for better or for worse. And so 
Um, I think that plays some role in it. And in Southeast Asia, it's just um, it's such a big driver of value, but it's, uh, it's not where they want their success, I don't think. It, it doesn't resonate. There's a hierarchy of nations, and the white nations are better in some people's eyes, not my eyes. I'm, I'm trying to draw more attention to it. Um, so uh, I hope that answers as well. Philip says, to what extent are more recent Helgers and dramas aimed at foreign audiences by a Netflix rather than domestic audience? It, it's a good question, Philip. Some things like Boys Planet and Girls Planet, but they're specifically uh, aimed at international audiences. And I, I think sometimes if you're ticking certain boxes, like let's have a trans character, let's do this, let's do this, they're not, in, in Korea you have Chuma drama, you have Pyongyang mm -hmm. drama, and Chuma drama is very different from what you see on Netflix. Mm -hmm. the, the dramas that are on Friday or Saturday night that you watch in the house on the big TV are different from the Netflix dramas. So I think Netflix gives a way for more Korean stories to be told. Um, I think they're sometimes aimed at foreign audiences, but also I think they're aimed at Korean people with their own smartphones and televisions. And they, they get best of both. So it's, it's not an amazing answer, but I'm very sorry, but they are done with audiences in mind because they need the money. I have a, maybe a combination of a question and a observation. I'd like to ask if you ever thought about uh, the aspect that the popularity of drama, entertainment, export products, also domestic consumption is mostly driven by money. Whatever is popular will be produced. Whatever earns more profit will be the result. And I think that's an aspect that maybe you didn't mention tonight. Anyway, uh, thank you for an excellent presentation. I 100% agree that money is the deciding factor. People will have all these ideas about boycott Japan, boycott Korean Air, but they're not going to buy a ticket on Korean Air. Money is what determines things. And um, sometimes for these things, do you pay money to watch them? I mean, here's a question. Do you pay money to watch the glory? Do you pay money to, to, to watch them? No, sometimes they're actually pushed at you. Like when you go out of your way and you go into a shop and you give them cash and you give them your, you can't give them cash, try to give cash. They're like, well, we don't do it cash. <laughs> give them your card, you're actually giving money. Sometimes these products, they're actually given to you as part of the service. You watch it because it comes up, you watch it because everybody's talking about hype is built. And so I agree money is 100% important, but I, I think sometimes we're not buying these things, we're watching them because everybody else is watching them. I didn't buy the glory on DVD. I just clicked the button, there it was. Does, it, does that help or what, what do you think about this idea that we don't buy these things, they're given to us? Uh, I have to confess, I haven't thought about it in people. Me neither. I was just wondering if you pushed a little bit your reflection also about what then would be good mediums, good ways to showcase or share this invisible part of Korea outside, you know, the the, the, the very extreme aspect that obviously is perceived in a certain way because. I think it's a generic effect as well when you don't really live in that reality and you have to face only the content they are produced in a certain way. Uh, you can lose a little bit of nuance. Uh, while I think everyone who lives in Korea kind of watch a drama, understands what it's about, but you know, like doesn't have that big impact. And I was wondering because I'm very interested also in how do we present Korea outside and how do we share aspects of Korea in a, in a maybe entertaining, interesting way, but that is not so extreme. And I was wondering if you had like any ideas and recommendations about it. Can I get your recommendation first? Yeah, uh, sign up for his uh, YouTube channel. That's what David's going to say. No, 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 no,
You sound a little bit French. Yeah. So I'm uh, French. Oui, oui, oui. So I grew up in France as a Korean. So uh, in my childhood, I was always confronted to have a very caricature view on Korea. You know, when people were interacting with me. When you come back here as a Korean guy who has grown up in France, you also get conflicted in aspects of the culture that we sometimes see also in drama that sometimes you disagree or, or, or like your software is just not you know calibrated in that way and stuff. Yeah. But we are always interested in trying to bring a little bit of subtlety and nuance and layers into what we can share about the Korean culture with people in general, right? And I think a lot of people when they come and travel here in Korea, they get to understand. But when it's they are staying outside and they consume those contents, at the end of the day, it's not also very easy for them. You know? So we, for example, are also facing the fact that anything that is speaking about Korea outside is either that K-pop group or Squid Game. And what about Korean craft? What about Korean art? What, like There are many, many subjects that are maybe valuable, but they are not just uh, like transmitted or, or shown and displayed outside. But I don't have a clear answer, but it's an ongoing process. And I was wondering also if you can share maybe something about that. I, I think you have the answer already. I, I think I came up with this term. I'm not sure if I've seen it around before. Hangul Kwa, Koreanization. Okay? Because we often talk about Pandepa, Segepa. We talk about globalization, we talk about modernization. So I would like to talk about the concept of Koreanization. Koreanization is when people come to Korea and they see it and they experience it for real. And then they take a little bit away with them. It might be their haircut. It might be the tattoo that they get. Lots of people get tattoos here. And then I tell them, you know, that's probably illegal that you got that. And they're like, oh my God. But Korea has an effect on people. And so I think. I, I support the crafts, the art, and all of these things, but rather than it being projected outwards, it will be now you get all these people coming to Korea and what they take back with them. So, and they can communicate in their own language to their mothers and fathers. And I tell this to my students sometimes on the last day of class, when, when they're going back to all over the world, I say, you came here to learn about Korea, to do Korean studies, and now you are part of Korean studies, you are part of Korea, because when you go back to your countries, people are going to ask you, what was Seoul like? What was Korea like? And how you answer that, how you respond to that, is building what Korea is. It's not changing the physical reality here, but in terms of consciousness, in terms of image, in terms of how people understand the country. I think it's the people that come here and then go away and talk about the, the shade and the heated bus stops. Uh, and these things, right? <laughs> You're okay. And, um, um, that's, that's, does that answer your question? So it's handle quite. I think it's people coming and then going back. Yeah. Uh, David, thank you very much. We really appreciate you coming.